so on this panel, we'll start really with a bit of a, a, a Q&A approach. I'm going to put a couple of questions to each of our panelists in turn so that we can weave, I hope, a little bit of a conversation for all of you in the audience that gives you a flavor, at least, of the mechanisms and processes that they have worked with. Uh, and then we'll open up the floor to all of you for questions as well. Let me flag, and you're probably familiar with this by now, that there is a sign-up sheet for questions. It's down here at the right, uh, my right, your left of the room. Uh, so please do feel free during the opening remarks to come up and put your name down if you'd like to ask a question. Um, there will be a very strict time limit of two minutes on questions, and I'll be asking everybody to stick to that out of courtesy to others who may want to raise issues. And the Secretariat will be helping me in making sure that we, we get a spread of, of stakeholder uh, uh, inputs to the question period. Um, I would also ask, please, as you think about your questions, please avoid set-piece statements. We very much welcome set-piece statements on the website. That's the place to put them. But here we want to be uh, interactive. Two other things. There is a uh, background piece of paper at the front of the room as well that just gives a very short description of each of the mechanisms and processes we're going to hear about to reduce a little of the pressure on trying to say everything in the context of this meeting. And then uh, I should say that Alex Guaqueta uh, from the UN Working Group, right down the far end, now you see why I wanted to stand with a microphone, <laughs> right down the far end, Alex from the UN Working Group, I'm very pleased to say, is with us uh, this afternoon as well, and uh, I'll be asking her to kick off our Q&A session. So with no more ado, we'll move into the, the panel, and I'll introduce each of our panelists in turn. The first of which is Natalie Bridgman Fields. And Natalie is the Executive Director of Accountability Council. Uh, Accountability Council is a non governmental organization that assists communities in accessing non judicial accountability mechanisms that are linked to internationally financed development projects, the regional development banks, World Bank uh, Group, and some of the national contact points as well, and advocating for the improvement of these same mechanisms. So, Natalie, turning first to you, the, the focus of your work is, um, in many ways, building the capacity of civil society stakeholders to engage with these mechanisms, uh, bring complaints to and make use of these uh, mechanisms. And can you start by telling us a little bit about the value, the importance of this ca capacity building role? Sure. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you for the invitation to speak today. Um, I, I think the, the first distinguishing point is that as opposed to working with company-sponsored grievance mechanisms or project-level grievance mechanisms, we do work at the international level. When communities come to Accountability Council for assistance, often they've tried to use a local-level grievance mechanism and it's failed or none existed in the first place. So the first thing that we do is work with them to build the capacity to jump over all those hurdles to access to using an international-level accountability mechanism. And although some communities around the world do have access to resources to file complaints and maneuver through the complex world of, of using an international mechanism, the vast majority of the communities that need these mechanisms, need non-judicial mechanisms, are some of the most vulnerable, the most marginalized. They're in some of the most remote areas of the world, particularly where there are resource conflict issues. And if given the tools, these communities, these vulnerable communities, can effectively use international level grievance mechanisms, but I think that my main point here is that it's unreasonable to expect that they can do so alone. As an example from my own work uh, in the remote Peruvian Amazon, there's a community that's facing a conflict with an oil company that got financing from the World Bank's IFC. And in order to use the World Bank's accountability office, the CAO, the community without our help would have to know that the World Bank exists. They would have to know that the World Bank financed the project. They would have to know that the World Bank has an accountability office. They would have to know how to file a complaint. They would have to know what information to put in to make it eligible. And then they would have to do the hard work of maneuvering through the process of following up on their complaint in an active way to make it effective. So they would have to do all that without being able to speak English. Often they speak indigenous languages where there's no translation of materials ever to that language. Uh, they would have to do so without any access to the internet. They would have to do so while trying to assure their basic survival as their main primary focus of their, their work and their time. Um, and all of these things are tremendous barriers and Accountability Council exists to help communities 
bridge those barriers. Amazingly, Accountability Council is the only organization in the world that I know of with the sole mission of assisting communities to access non-judicial recourse mechanisms. While other organizations are doing that with part of their time, uh, it's a, a vastly under-resourced uh, area that, that needs much more support. So once we help communities file a complaint, the capacity building work has really just begun. After that, we, the, the filing of the complaint is, is, has not been enough to correct the power imbalance between a company with resources and a marginalized community. So at that point, our work is to give the community every possible advantage to enter a dialogue on equal footing to a company or international institution about a grievance. We work on, with communities about how to voice a position, uh, how to determine what's relevant and what can be addressed through a grievance process, in essence, how to negotiate. Um, and this is very challenging, difficult, time-consuming work. Um, but without this work, many of the non-judicial recourse mechanisms we talk about in this conference and, and in the, the RUGI process in general are really only theoretical. Thank you, Natalie. Um, you've given us a sense of what things look like, perhaps, and feel like from the perspective of, of communities uh, when they enter these processes. I'd like to just jump to the perspective of, of, of companies, or at least your, your, your take on things as you think about the companies that are involved in these uh, processes. You've seen a variety of different kinds of, of company reaction when uh, faced with the, the proposition of, 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 of handling a complaint through these processes and of the role that Accountability Council is playing with communities. What would your advice be to a company that, that finds itself in this situation? I, I think the first piece of advice is to do a thorough investigation and take responsibility early on. That can avoid a worsening of the problem and it can also avoid a, a further problem with mistrust that could develop and make a resolution of a dispute through a grievance process impossible. Understanding the power imbalance that I discussed earlier is critical to coming in with some ground rules for negotiation that are equitable and rights compatible and um, are consistent with the guiding principles. And the importance of negotiating in good faith is a final point that I think is in incredibly critical. Again, to the example of Peru to provide a, a quick grounding of, of what these principles mean in practice. In that case, the parties actually <coughs> failed to reach a resolution of the dispute, in part because the company's first priority was to make the problem go away, to silence dissent, not to engage on the actual issues itself. And to do that, they said, we're only going to talk to the directly affected people in these villages. We don't want to talk to Accountability Council, and we don't want to talk to the Indigenous Federation leaders. Um, the communities protested this vociferously because we'd worked at their request to support them through the entire complaint research and fact-finding and, and drafting process, and also assisting them with the capacity to stand up to a corporation that had used forced labor, that had contaminated their waterways, abused local women. Uh, really serious human rights violations. So after all that work, the, the mediator appointed to, to solve this dispute uh, didn't do any work bilaterally with the company to ensure that they understood that a rights-compatible process would mean that just as the company has a lawyer in the room, an advocate in the room, so too deserve the communities to have an advocate at their side to make this a rights-compatible process. So another lesson learned and advice for a community coming out of this same Peru case um, is that in entering the dialogue in good faith, it goes a long way to assure the likelihood of successful results. Uh, in this example, the central human rights and environmental grievances at issue in the complaint were not addressed in the merits through the dispute resolution process. As a result of the failure to take a proactive uh, role to, to use good faith, the issues continue today, and just last month, the community uh, was forced to a position of, of taking civil disobedience and occupying, peacefully occupying the wells on their land, uh, shutting down operations at great expense to the company and at great personal risk to the communities as well, because as I said, basic survival is their first goal. When they're sitting in, um, doing a sit-in on oil operations, they're not fishing and getting protein for their communities, frankly. Um, and all of that could have been avoided had there been a good faith negotiation through a dispute resolution mechanism at the outset. Um, and so it's costly for all parties, and so I would say good faith negotiation is, is probably the, the number one. 
Thanks very much. And that, I think, leads us neatly into a discussion with Hege Rottingen, who is the head of the Secretariat of the National Contact Point of Norway. Um, the, as many will know, uh, the countries, the states that sign up to the guidelines for multinational enterprises of the OECD all have a national contact point that is responsible both for promoting those guidelines, which very much reflect the UN guiding principles in their content, and for handling complaints about alleged breaches of the guidelines, uh, which is something, Hager, that you've been very much involved with through your work. And, and indeed, on that point about dialogue, you typically aim in the NCP to focus on dialogue and mediation. So first question, why mediation? Um, well, uh, in, uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Uh, in uh, many of the that uh, come to us, uh, there has been bilateral talks and uh, the uh, NGO uh, typically has uh, tried to, uh, in, in one case, uh, the NGO had screamed environmental warnings at the company for uh, seven years and they felt that the company didn't want to listen to them. Uh, the company, on their part, felt attacked. And uh, uh, what uh, the NCP could do was to offer an, a neutral arena to bring the parties together and help them talk together. And uh, what we've found is that bilateral talks seldom, uh, or uh, bilateral talks can go on forever, but uh, mediation can actually offer solutions. And uh, we think that mediation is uh, the preferred solution uh, compared to issuing a final statement. And uh, uh, in, uh, I've uh, put some brochures about uh, uh, what we do at the uh, side of the room there, and there are two examples one case that uh, uh, went to mediation and offered a solution, and the other case where the company rejected mediation. And uh, uh, what, what we found is that a uh, solution can, first of all, help business engage with their opponents in a non-confrontal way. And secondly, it can be a learning process. And third, it's forward-looking. It provides common tools to deal with f future issues. And we heard from Natalie a bit about capacity building as well. And, and I know in at least one, if not more recent cases, that's also been a feature of what you've done. So tell us a bit more about that and how that fits in from your perspective. Hmm. Uh, consensus cannot be achieved if one party feels inferior. And the company usually has more uh, economic power to engage experts or lawyers. And um, we want to equip all parties to the NCP process uh, to come to the table, make informed decisions, and uh, be able to conclude efficiently. And we also think that by doing that, uh, we can make uh, the commitments that the company uh, undertakes uh, more robust, that the whole agreement can be, uh, the mediated outcome can be more robust. You've highlighted there, I think, a, a couple of lessons that sound as if they have broader applications. So a final question, any other points you would highlight that you think from your experience might be relevant for other mechanisms and processes? Yeah. Natalie also mentioned the language barrier. And uh, we've uh, uh, translated uh, even drafts into local languages uh, so that uh, the parties that are involved in the NCP process can be able to go back to the local community and consult with them before a conclusion is made. And uh, we've uh, translated brief uh, information on the OECD guidelines. Chinese, uh, Spanish are two examples we're now translating into the Norwegian indigenous population's language, the Sami. Uh, first point is that um, there are limits to mediation, and uh, mediation is our uh, preferred outcome. But, but uh, grave viola uh, violations of human rights are best addressed by courts. And uh, uh, before I leave this point, I want to underscore that there is a separate space for non-legal uh, remedies, in particular for mediation. 
mediated outcome can give more than the law we've found. Uh, for example, in all our cases, the NGOs have been very eager to get non-financial reporting into the mediated agreement, specifically because it's hard to find those requirements in national laws where the operations are. Second thing is that we have actually pierced the corporate veil, which would be unheard of through the court system, because the company has voluntarily engaged. And uh, um, many call for stronger legal remedies. And uh, uh, even if we solved all the legal uh, obstacles to justice, courts would never be able to cope with all the harms. So non-legal remedies like the OECD national contacts points would be vital in tackling the issues that need not go to the court. And second point, and I'll make that very brief, uh, grievance mechanisms need trust to function. Uh, and key to that is transparency. Uh, the Norwegian NCP has split our uh, procedures into three. First phase is when we receive a complaint, we have transparency. Second phase, when we examine the case, fact-finding, mediation, draft our uh, final statements, confidentiality. Third phase is our outcome, mediated or final statement, we have transparency. And I think by being open and clear about our procedures, we also give business predictability, which business wants. And my third and last point would be, true dialogue on business society conflicts take a lot of courage. Mediation is a really, really hard exercise because it involves concessions. And a wise man has once said that courage is what it takes to stand up and speak. But courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen. So key to success in mediation is being willing to sit down and listen and really understand the perspective of the other party for common good. And that is something that the NCP would want to contribute to. Thank you, Heidi. You give a, a lot of good food for thought there and it is very timely that we now come to the company perspective on some of this, having heard from non, a non-governmental organization and a government perspective. And I'm pleased that we have Mike Josios on the, the panel with us. Uh, Mike is the Vice President of Corporate Affairs for SNA Boites, which is a, a joint venture power company in the Philippines focused on hydroelectric power and uh, related services. And SNA Boites became involved in a dialogue and dispute resolution process after the privatization of some power plants uh, around some communities called Ambuklam Binga. Um, and following, because the privatization had funding from the International Finance Corporation, the a complaint came via the, the compliance advisor ombudsman um, associated with the IFC um, and, and generated a process, Mike, that, that you were involved with and Essena Boitis was involved with. So tell us then from your perspective as a company, what was your, the company's sort of immediate reaction upon the proposition of engaging in this kind of, uh, of a process? Well, Carolyn, uh, first of all, thank you very much for <coughs> inviting me. And uh, I'm not an expert on mediation or conflict resolution, but uh, probably based on our experience, uh, we can share a little on what we did. Um, coming in uh, the privatization process in 2008, uh, our due diligence showed that uh, there were a lot of uh, residual land claims. These are historical claims that... Uh, uh, were brought about by the construction of the dam in the 1950s. So a major um, uh, issue that lingers up until the privatization process was the uh, claims on lands and compensation and resettlement. And there's a lot of, uh, of uh, talks that has gone uh, before with government, uh, but the people in the community felt that there was overwhelming um, need to again raise this issue now with the private sector coming into the picture. So uh, at first, of course, uh, we did our due diligence. Uh, we knew that we had to manage these issues. We did stakeholders engagement and uh, communication strategy and policy. We were intent in uh, communicating to the communities and to the stakeholders that we are a different company. We are going to write a new chapter in Ambuklao and Binga. And there was therefore anxiety going into the mediation process. Uh, this anxiety, of course, stems from the fact that uh, would we have control? Would we know the outcome? Would we increase the risk that we have signed up for? 
And these are, of course, uh, major investment decisions that we have to make. But we knew that the community and the stakeholders, particularly the indigenous peoples, have overwhelming uh, request and sentiment to raise this issue again and to make sure that this issue is discussed move, moving forward and even before the acquisition process is closed. So that overwhelming uh, demand from the community, of course, with the uh, complaint with the Compliance Advisor Ombudsman, gave us the opportunity to, to prove to them, to prove to the community that being part of the process means that we are willing to be part of the solution rather than contest it or resist it or you know, disregard the complaint altogether. So that was the compelling reason why we also subscribe to the mediation process. Some might think, well, why not sit down bilaterally and n talk directly, ne negotiate? Why, where do you see the reason, the rationale, the benefit of having, as you did, a, a mediator uh, holding that circle? Well, I think, um, of course, uh, from a company perspective, uh, you will always have to to, um, to secure your position. Um, of course, you will have to make sure that in the negotiation process, you are in control, and you have to, uh, to uh, assess the facts uh, as it affirms your position. So in a bilateral negotiation process, there would be an inherent animosity uh, between the parties, and uh, all the issues may not be surfaced, all the issues may not be resolved, and only those issues that need to be resolved to achieve results may be, uh, may be uh, addressed by the company. It's not an inclusive solution and something that may not last altogether. So I think uh, the benefit really is to go through a mediation process than a bilateral negotiation process. And as I understand it, you, you reached a, a memorandum of agreement with communities, but that, that has not been, as it were, the end of the process. Can you tell us a bit more about what has, has happened since? Yes. Um, during the mediation process, the, there was a, uh, a capacity enhancement or capacity building process. I think one of the value of the mediation process is that the mediator altogether uh, works out to level the, play, uh, the, to level the playing field. And this uh, also requires that, number one, it establishes trust and respect among the stakeholders. Number two, uh, that it levels the playing field in the, in the negotiation process. And uh, there was a capacity building process uh, during that negotiation or uh, mediation process. And out of that capacity building, there was a uh, consensus that all the stakeholders uh, coming into the negotiation process or the mediation process are willing now to declare the real position uh, to be transparent on what they feel about the proposals and the counter proposals and to come up with this uh, framework of really agreeing and uh, um, um, coming with solutions moving forward. So out of that framework was an agreement to establish an indigenous people's heritage site. And this agreement is significant considering that the fight initially was for the compensation of the lands that were taken away during the, the construction of the dams. But now, because that cannot happen anymore, uh, because government has already established that they were expropriated in the 1950s and uh, due payment were paid, but since the issue still lingers, government and, uh, of course, our company also uh, agreed to uh, come up with a framework to return the land, to return the remaining use of the land to the communities. And this land is now called the Indigenous People's Heritage Site, which forms the basic agreement among others, it includes, of course, supporting the development goals of the community and the indigenous peoples, uh, providing a framework for aligning our operational and rehabilitation activities with a participative and consultative process needed by the community, and of course, moving forward with a framework to continuous negotiation and dialogue so that any issues arising from our operations would immediately be resolved by the stakeholders' council set up in that agreement. Thank you, Mike. So it really paints a picture of an ongoing dialogue then that was, was created out of the initial process. I'd like to turn now to Loretta Lamti, who I'm delighted also we, we have with us, uh, to bring in the perspective of a national human rights institution. Um, Loretta is the, the commissioner, the chief commissioner of uh, the Ghana Commission for Human Rights and Administrative Justice, um, which is empowered to handle complaints regarding impacts on human rights, not just regarding government, but also regarding companies. And in 
some regards, this is uh, the, a number of national human rights institutions that can do this, but it's by far not, not all of them. So some very interesting experience to gather from you. Uh, can you tell us, Loretta, perhaps one or two examples of how the Commission in practice has got involved in this space of company-community uh, disputes? There we go, Chris and Paul, sorry. Thank you, Caroline, yes, and, and thank you for the invitation. It's certainly a privilege uh, to, to be here. Um, the, the Commission got involved um, primarily with communities that were affected by the operations of mining companies um, as a result of, uh, I would say, public advocacy um, by civil society groups complaining about the impact that some of these mining company operations uh, had on the, the, the livelihoods and the, the daily quality of living in these communities. And uh, whereas in many circumstances there were investment agreements, I would say in all circumstances there would have been investment agreements from the, um, between the company and the government. And within those agreements, issues like compensation, resettlement, um, things like that were, were covered in general. But what one found was that several years later, um, many of these uh, commitments had not had not been met fully. And so we had uh, communities complaining about very often environmental issues, um, some of which have, have come up in, in the other cases, uh, water pollution, resettlement that didn't take into account the, the daily living. So people were resettled, but their farms were still close to the mine. And so they had you know long journeys um, to get back to their farms or, or not proper valuations. And in some cases, uh, simply nothing had been done after the commitments had been um, entered into. And uh, I would echo what, what, what Hege had said. Um, what, what we felt was that mediation is what would actually get to a result, as opposed to a constant complaint by the communities. They were regularly going through their their internal mechanisms uh, through chieftaincy councils. They were having conversations with the companies, but um, you know they were not in a position to get orders saying, "Pay this this compensation." Um, and so we 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 handled a few cases and then realized that it was actually systemic. These were not these were not direct violations, and I absolutely agree that grave violations of human rights should. Be, be handled in a judicial uh, setting. Um, these were it, impact violations without a company deciding it was going to you know, violate anyone's rights, but they were having a major impact. And, um, and so therefore it was in their very nature that there was a foundation of an acceptance of the rights of these people, because obviously if you come in, you know, uh, to, to, to operate, you've, you've accepted to pay compensation. There's a basic understanding of the rights, but it's how it was being implemented. And once we realized that it went across board with a number of companies, we then did a more, um, did an investigation in the state, on to the state of human rights in the mining sector in Ghana through a number of, of um, communities. Uh, what, what I would say in terms of one or two is that the, the, the the broad issues were, as I say, a lot of them were environmental. But then you had um, you, a case, for example, where where a young boy touched uh, live live ammunition um, from a dump uh, from one of the mining companies. And again, by the time we were coming in, it was not that you had a company not recognizing the rights of of the individual. They had fitted him out with. Uh, its arm had had to be amputated. They had fitted him with a prosthetic limb, entered into agreements to, to retrain him, to retrofit this limb every couple of years. And then 10 years later, he'd been almost forgotten and the company was not meeting its, its obligations. So basically, in our situation, we, we, I guess we're lucky because we felt there was a starting point of an acceptance of, of rights on the part of these communities. And for that reason, 
our role was really as the Human Rights Commission to, to address that imbalance that, that Natalie, that the speakers have spoken about where the, 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 the victims cannot stand there and demand their rights, but there is an understanding that they have rights um, and where we could then speak for them, but in a non-confrontational manner and, and basically end up with something that, that was fair, but also took into account the company's operations. And you, you touch there uh, upon the, um, the, that important distinction between when you can engage in this process again and, and when judicial mechanisms are needed. You also, though, have in your powers adjudication as well as mediation. So how do you decide and assess which of those two channels, non-judicial adjudication and dialogue, are, are most appropriate? Um, I, I think that we found that mediation uh, Pro probably 80% of our cases actually get handled by mediation, which is a, a very high high percentage, and it's something that as a country we're sort of uh, pushing forward. Obviously, these are not all in the area of business. They are only a, a minority would be. And, but um, I, think, I think, first of all, the, the, the clarity of the issues. In a case, in the kind of cases that we had where there are multiple communities, um, different types of violations in in each community uh, you know in one community it's buildings to falling down because of the vibrations of blasting and so they need a certain level of redress and in another community it's a question of, of more boreholes so so it needed it, it in that kind of situation um, mediation allows you to take into account the different circumstances of, of the different cases. But also, uh, it was important the fact that, as you say, we do have um, the ability to adjudicate. And, and so our aim is to, to, as wiser people than me have said, to speak softly but wield a big stick. We have that in the back of our minds, and I think that was also the case. And it, it's important in dealing with business that they know that there can be a resort to actual judicial or in our case quasi-judicial orders which um, are not limited in scope. We could say compensation and we could decide entirely on our own what's fair and reasonable and that would not get to the best solution. So in a situation where, where the violator um, has that understanding of, of, of the nature of the rights and we're not disputing whether whether there's been a violation, we found that mediation, we, we use that where it, where it seems the fairest option. Thank you. That, that's very helpful. Well, let me turn to um, Oleg Sapozhnikov to your right um, and, and bring us uh, back into a company perspective and this time looking particularly at a, at a grievance mechanism. And we heard from uh, uh, Oleg's CEO this morning in the, in the opening uh, session. Um, Oleg is, is external affairs manager for Sakhalin Energy Investment Company, uh, an operator of the Sakhalin 2 uh, project in uh, eastern Russia. Um, and the company has a grievance mechanism, actually has, as we heard this morning, three different kinds of grievance mechanism, but one of them is specifically for affected communities and contractors uh, around uh, the Sakhalin Energy operations, uh, including the, the, the pipeline as well as the, the, the um, main installations. Um, in, indeed, this was one of the uh, companies that we worked with to pilot the principles for effective grievance mechanism that generated a, a public report also of the learning that we all gained from that. And this mechanism then, Oleg, is, is embedded in your social commitments as, as a company. Um, I just want to flag to everybody when Oleg speaks, he's going to speak in Russian. We have interpretation, so please, just so that you're, you're ready, um, Oleg speaks very nice English, but feels very much more comfortable uh, speaking uh, Russian. So I shall ask questions in English, and Oleg will reply in Russian. So, Oleg, um, from your experience working uh, with the grievance mechanism for communities and, and contractors, what do you see as the most important practical tools for any company planning to implement a grievance mechanism? First of all, my apologies for my Russian speaking. I'm not sure about my English, it's far from the perfect, so I prefer to speak in Russian. Okay. Uh,
when we're talking about the procedure of grievance lodging, of lodging grievances, there are more than one element. There are about four na elements, namely. I would like to identify the four elements that allow us to implement this grievance mechanism and to contribute to the grievance resolution according to the RAGI principles and team. First, the procedure of lodging grievances should not be a separate procedure. It shouldn't be a complaint book, so to say, which is present at any retail shop. The procedure of lodging grievances should be part, an integral part of the management of any company. And those issues that deal with grievances processing should be made part and parcel of ru rules and regulations of people responsible for the settlement of grievances. The second item, the second important point to speak of is the following. The procedure itself, the mechanism itself, should be a very straightforward, clear-cut procedure and mechanism. It should be traceable from the point of registrating grievances down to the settlement of the grievances and tracking the consequences. Practically speaking, we have an automated procedure that registers and records all grievances. All grievances must be settled within 45 day working days from the time the grievance is lodged. And at each stage, we must not fall out of the deadline. If the person responsible does not settle the grievance, then the system automatically generates an email and sends a notice to the higher-ups. It is potentially possible that this grievance will be received by the C chief executive officer, the CEO of the company. It stimulates employees to review uh, the grievances rapidly, effectively, and on time. The third point, there are various types of grievances. And the most important thing from the onset, to set the priorities straight, there are some grievances that must be settled, settled immediately, rapidly. We're talking about the vulnerable groups of population, those grievances that deal with issues of security and safety, at the workplace and we do recommend our experience to other companies we have a matrix of assessing risks where from the very onset each grievance is put in in the matrix and we assign a certain rating of a certain rating of importance and uh, it determines the speed and involving different echelons and tiers of the company. And the fourth point, Saharin 2 is a tremendous, is a humongous project, and they are carried out not only by the main contractor, but its subcontracts. It enters into subcontractual relations. For the headquarters, it's very important to ensure that compliance with the human rights is fully up to speed. And they are also making sure that the subcontractors do not violate human rights. What we look at the company, we look at the social responsibility very seriously. Sakhalin Energy takes the social responsibility very seriously. All those resp social responsibilities are part and parcel of the contractual relations and contracts with subcontractors. And of course, the violation of social standards is a contractual violation, and it is fraught with financial consequences to the subcontractors. And we need permanent monitoring and tracking of the actions of the subcontractors for them not to ever violate the human rights. Our grievance uh, procedures uh, cover the personnel of contractors. The employees employed by contractors and subcontractors have are entitled to using our mechanism and are free to address the management of our company. That is in a nutshell what I wanted to t share with you. Those are the four important points that I would like to identify if we want to introduce the grievance lodging procedure effectively and successfully. That's how I can sum up our experience. Thank you. Thank you, um, Oleg, and I'd love just to hear from you as well your uh, perspective on the benefits that having this grievance mechanism has brought to you as a company and not least with regard to the extent to which you feel that it has helped to build better relationships and trust with the communities and others. <coughs>
Yes, of course, certainly. Introducing the grievance procedure yields tangible results to the company and is highly fruitful to the company. Along with my, our other colleagues, we are carrying out disputes whether these grievances are helpful or not. Some consider that it's a liability for business. However, our experience testifies to the fact that it yields real dividends to the company. The topic of our session is the non-judicial remedy, pre-trial remedy. And if we look at the period starting from the implementation of the project, when we introduced the grievance lodging procedures, we introduced the procedure about 10 years ago, we have received about 300 grievances. Those grievances were settled before they went to court. It was an example of the non-judicial remedy. If you compare it with the number of suits that were filed with the courts, the number of suits do not exceed 10. 300 grievances were settled amicably before court. It was an example of the non-judicial remedy. And 10 lawsuits were filed which were settled in court. We, are very, we take pride that due to the grievance procedures, we are keeping the activity of our subcontractors and contractors under control, carrying out their social responsibility, being environmentally conscious and responsible. And therefore, as a result, we have much fewer legal judicial risks that are brought about by violations of the human rights. So we view the grievance procedure as an yet an additional element of bringing up to speed and informing how the project is being implemented. On top of all of the above, the procedure itself enables us to form and put together a relationship of confidence and trust with the society in la at large and with the local populace. In a nutshell, briefly, thank you. Thank you so much, Oleg. And um, we're going to stay with the theme of grievance mechanisms for a moment as we jump geography and stakeholder perspective to Felipe Borgeño, who is on your right. And Felipe is a representative of Cereal. That's the Center for Reflection and Action on Labor Rights, uh, an organization that campaigns against the violation of human rights, and particularly labor rights in Mexico, including with regard to the electronics industry in Guadalajara. And uh, interestingly, Cereal has become a, and, and is uh, in, in many ways an integral actor to a grievance handling process established uh, with suppliers to electronics industry brands and retailers uh, in the Guadalajara uh, region. And, and so, uh, Felipe, I'd like you to start us off by just giving us a quick overview of how the mechanism actually works and your role within it. Thank you. It's, thank you very much for the invitation, and thank you, uh, everyone, for being here. I will uh, try to speak in English. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Serial is an organization which, uh, uh, which provides legal advice to the electronic workers. We help them to organize themselves. And we provide capacity, bu capacity bu the building and training on, on rights. We also do our research on labor conditions in Mexico, electronic industry, Mexican electronic industry. And we have been uh, talking directly to the companies with a dialogue uh, which began in 2005. In April 2006, Cereal and Canieti, Canieti is the Chamber of Commerce of the electronic industry, agreed a way of working on a specific cases. In Two hundred and, and, and seven, we reviewed and updated the, the mechanism. Um, uh, well, when a worker has a complaint, if they don't get a satisfactory answer for the company, they come to Serial, and we do. And if, if the worker uh, cover all the requirements, we do a research uh, on the case, and, and then we try to find a solution, and we represent to the workers. We represent the workers with the companies and manufacturers and, the, and brands uh, sometimes. At the same time, uh, we still use it the legal, uh, the legal uh, way because uh, the workers just have a, a, short, uh, a short period to make a, a legal uh, complaint. And if they don't uh, make a complaint in, uh, in this uh, period, uh, they can lose their the rights. No? <coughs> uh, we think that uh, this legal process uh, create uh, an extra pressure for the for the companies and they do more 
uh, and they are more interested to solving the, the case. So uh, serial thing, things, uh, it's uh, vital to have a both a judicial and non-judicial uh, mechanism. One of the challenges uh, that the workers in electronic industry face in Mexico is the problem of, of uh, inactive unions uh, this means that the workers don't have uh, representation and legal process can be very slow and not uh, enforce it. This is the reason because we uh, have uh, this agreement with the, with the companies and, well, you can, you can see the, the diagram in the, in the background note at the end, this one, and, well, you can see more uh, detailed the, the, the process. Thank you, Felipe. So tell us, if you would, uh, from your perspective, what you see as some of the strengths of this mechanism and what perhaps you see as some of its limitations as well. Yeah. Uh, before and the companies began talking to each other, it was a quite hostile relationship. Uh, now we have a very open relationship uh, open if we disagree with uh, their points of view. We can uh, talk about... Uh, the, all the, the, the issues. Uh, one of the most uh, important benefits is the time it takes to solve uh, cases. When we didn't use the process, in, it took on average uh, two years. Uh, but now, uh, well, now depends on the circumstances and the companies involved, but it takes an average one or two months uh, to resolve uh, a case. A case. Also, there have been uh, concrete uh, improvements to the requirement process as a result of dialogue with, with uh, Serial. So for instance, uh, in the past, labor agencies asked questions like, is there a lawyer in, the, in your family of, or if you are uh, pregnant or have tattoos or some kind of, of questions? Uh, this kind of, uh, now, uh, most of the agencies no, no longer use these, these uh, discriminatory uh, questions. Uh, but we haven't, we haven't, uh, we haven't uh, made the same uh, progress on more structural issues, especially on freedom of, of association and the ability to the workers for, to organize themselves and represent uh, themselves. Also on related uh, issues, for example, uh, temporary contracts, wages, uh, payments, benefits, rights if the worker are, are dismissal. These cases are more difficult to solve because the company needs to make an structural changes to solve them. And it was uh, make, uh, it has, ma it ha it has uh, taken many years to get uh, these issues of uh, freedom of association and temporary contracts on the agenda with the electronic companies. Uh, but uh, the, st uh, the structural changes are really important. Uh, if, uh, why? Because, uh, because uh, they are re they, uh, related to the basic labor rights uh, on the workers. Also, in some cases, the dialogue, the dialogue has been uh, needed uh, because the companies have not been meeting the requirements uh, of the law. Uh, so in some circumstances, the labor tribunal ordered the company to rehire the worker, but the company doesn't do this. No? There are uh, even examples where the company rehires the worker just for a day and then uh, dismisses them. So we recognize that we need to make more prog progress that achieve more man meaningful benefits for the, for the workers. And it's not uh, enough uh, just to involve a local, uh, we, we think that it's not enough uh, just involve the local representatives of uh, the companies. Uh, we need to involve uh, other higher levels uh, of the company because sometimes uh, the local representatives can't uh, make uh, changes. They don't have uh, sufficient authority. That is why Serial invites uh, the international executives from AICC companies, included uh, brands, <coughs> instead of only taking to Kanieti. Uh, the level of commitment, commitment of the companies is very important. Sometimes it's, uh, it's difficult to talk to the companies with, uh, uh, within Kanieti because uh, they don't uh, all uh, have the same level of commitment. Uh, sometimes they uh, lack the information or they don't uh, want to comply with the labor law or, they, or the orders of the labor uh, tribunal. Uh, uh, the companies uh, 
must uh, talk directly with the workers and involve the workers in this process. Serial wants to be able to, to step back uh, so that the companies can have a negotiation with the workers themselves. Uh, that is why we have been pushing to the companies on freedom of association, uh, even uh, though it, it has taken a long time uh, for them uh, to be willing to just talk about this, this issue. Some of the companies have uh, said that they are willing to talk uh, to the workers' coalition, but others aren't will yet, uh, willing yet. And we haven't uh, seen any changes in the practice yet, uh, but so for Serial, this is a very important way to make the mechanism more uh, legitimate and sustainable. Felipe, thank you. Thank you for painting that, that picture for us. And 